comes to us out of the letter to the Ephesians written by Paul. What's another name for a letter? Epistle. An epistle. The epistle that Paul wrote was to those he loved in the uh, community of Ephesus. He wrote one, as we found out this morning, to the Galatian church. It's very similar. It has some of the similar uh, words, some of the, uh, the similar messages that uh, impact the way the people were living. This morning we're going to talk about how we're living. We're going to talk about how the gospel relates exactly to our life situations. We're going to, we're going to understand how Paul, who started many of the small churches in the beginning, kept in touch with them and tried to guide them into the path that Christ walked. Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. I want to start with that this morning. And here are the words of the Apostle. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to their neighbors, for we are all members of one body. Let me try the uh, fifth chapter. <laughs> 15, 15 through 20. Someone needed to hear that, though. Thank you. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand the, what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the children say, Amen. Amen. It is a word to you from the apostle that is as clear as it was the day he wrote it. It is an opportunity for us to learn by listening, by reading, by absorbing the things of God's way into a life that has opportunities to be worldly or spiritual. At 67, I have experienced almost every portion of life that can be offered either personally or by my children. That's how I start out by counseling sessions with everyone that comes in to see me, no matter what the problem is, no matter what the situation in life. I tell them that I have experienced life to the fullest and that I have experienced life even beyond my own experiences to those experiences of my children. And therefore, there's nothing that you can say that I can't respond to in some way with the help of Christ who leads me. The only difference is if you come in for marital counseling, and I start with this. There's nothing that you can ask me or say to me that will embarrass me. And then I finish it with that same statement. Because I've experienced life, all that life has to offer, either personally or through my children. There's nothing you can say or ask me that will embarrass me. Because I've been there, done that, experienced that in one way or another. And that's what happens in life, isn't it? That's what happens as we grow into adulthood. And some of us are still children in that journey, no matter what our chronic logical age is. The truth is that I have lived my life so filled with experience that I have tasted much of the best and, of course, some of the worst. My truth for you today is the same as the truth the Apostle Paul is trying to share with the people in his day. There is a sense of urgency to his message 
as I hope you understand a sense of urgency from mine as well. There is so little time to get it right. This morning when I woke up, after a, a, a night of tossing and turning, and I looked at Candy and I said, you know, it seems like yesterday was Sunday. She said, it was. It, it seems like time is going by so fast. And in that urgency, we need to hear the message that the Apostle has for us, that God has for us. It's a shame when we find it necessary to waste our precious time with the things of the world instead of finding a way of making Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit the focus of our life and our direction. We talk about Jesus in our heart with the children. But aren't we saying the same thing when we say the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Because Christ in our heart and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit are basically one and the same. And we allow foolish distractions of this world to take us away from that. And those foolish distractions are there planted in this world by the evil one who controls so much and so many most of you know in our association and getting to know each other that as I grew up, I graduated from a military high school in Camden, South Carolina. I was, I was away from home that I might get a, an education that would be beneficial to me. Oh, it was beneficial to me. <laughs> Once a year in Camden, South Carolina, Kershaw County would hold their county fair. The fairgrounds were divided from our military school by a fence on the back boundary. Saturday night of the fair would always be a time when the cadets would gather together sneak out of the barracks, jump the fence, and run over to the girly shows. Wow. I don't know that they have girly shows in the fairs now, but they had girly shows in those days. <laughs> now, I have two brothers and no sisters. I was tempted to join my comrades. I was tempted, oh, so tempted county fair of my senior year, my comrades and I joined together, jumped the fence, went to the fair, stood in line, heads down, money out, went to the girly show. To our surprise, but even more surprised than that, behind us entered the commandant of the school. Oh. <laughs> And you see, I knew it wasn't planned because he was more surprised than we were. Oh. <laughs> and that is where I learned that old cliche, what happens at the Kershaw County Fair stays at the Kershaw County Fair. And that's the only thing that kept us from being expelled. <laughs> we immediately went back to the barracks and nobody was the wiser. You see, temptations are thrown out in this world to trip us, out, trip us up every day and in every way. But Paul compares the high that we get from living to our temptations as the source of life is only temporary. In contrast to when we turn our lives over to the Holy Spirit, when we turn our lives over to Christ, and start living in the way that Christ would have us live, that kind of high is eternal. And it brings joy and it brings gratitude. The Gospel according to Pastor Kim, it sounds to me like Paul is describing a race to salvation. Time is so precious and time is so wasted along the way. Time offers so many meaningless solutions to worldly options. You see, it's a little bit like the suggestions the world has it is like patching the holes in a, in a 
in a pot and it lasts for a little while and then it breaks free. The human race is obsessed with so many things in so many directions, it seems that we are our worst offense instead of defense. And the worst of all is time. Everywhere we go, we have to know what time it is. Every one of us has a watch or a clock or, or something with it. The uh, younger generation would say to you, I've got my uh, Apple Watch that controls not only the time, but my heartbeat, my exercise, my calendar. In the intermediate, they would pull out a cell phone and say, look, I've got time and date and temperature and barometric pressure, yada, yada, yada. But most of us have a way to be controlled by the time of every day. You get in your car and you drive along and the bank is screaming out the time and temperature. Hurry up, get going. This is the way we live. Time robs us of the good things so many times. I was told once that if I'm running late to call my boss and tell him or her, whichever the case may be, that even though I'm going to be 10 minutes late, I'm going to be 20 minutes late. And that way two things happen, or one of two things happen. The first one is, if you get there in 10 minutes, you're a hero for working so hard to make it, make it better. If something happens along the way, you're still covered. You don't have to be late twice. <laughs> All of the stress of coping with the pressures of life drive us to resolve or unresolve. Is that even a word, unresolve? It infers that we are handling life without God with unresolved. With resolve, we are following in the footsteps of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us that in his world, unresolved was the mishandling of things that were distractions, like wine. Paul uses wine as a, as a suggestion of how it breaks down not only our lives, but the lives of everyone around us. And he talks about being drunk on wine there's a long-term difference, Paul tells us, in being drunk on wine and high on the Holy Spirit. I'm reminded on Pentecost Day when even the, the new Christians, the disciples and the apostles that were called on that day, and they were, they were um, under the influence of the Holy Spirit at that day of Pentecost. And what were they accused of? They were accused of being drunk. And Peter stands up and says, look at your watch. It's only nine in the morning. What they're high on is not the distractions of the world. They're high on the Holy Spirit. Paul uses other words about abuse. Other words of temporary delays in our long-term lives. And how those tricks of this world keep us off the path. That Paul talks to us about how sometimes we lean towards things like drunkenness to take away the pain of this life. And I would say to you, ask anyone who has abused an addiction or alcohol and ask them if the fix was worth the pain. Paul tells us it goes beyond that. It leads to debauchery. Amen. I wrote debauchery in the sidelight of my Bible. I tend to be misguided because debauchery sounded like uh, falsehoods and lying, but it's not that. Debauchery is this, this drive that pulls you away from your morality and your virtue and turns you into a person of the world that is so hard to come back from. Some facts that came to me this week. One out of every ten children have an alcoholic parent. But by the time our children become seniors, 
80% of our children in high school have, have used alcohol or drugs. And that 62% of them have abused alcohol or drugs into a time uh, in a state of drunkenness. There are 14 million citizens of our country who are addicted, which drives this next statistic of 75% of the women in our community and in our country suffer physical abuse. This, my friends, my sisters, my brothers, this is debauchery nationwide. And the question then comes, what is it that controls your life? Not who is it that controls your life, but, but what is it that controls your life? Paul is asking that question of you. Paul is asking that question of the congregations of then, but also to the times of now. What is the influence that controls and guides you towards a positive or negative decision? Here's a plus for those of you who have decided to be a part of the faith community. Because you see a, a Holy Spirit life led encounter it becomes in you joy and gratitude and Paul calls us to sing. There is a study, of course, there's studies on everything, but there's a study on people who are in church choirs and how it changes their lives and the lives of those around them. And it reveals this, this segment of our community of believers who receive and give graciously joy and gratitude. Those who sing for the Lord. Members of a choir. Members of a congregation. Now here are some of the perks, and I know we don't have a I know we don't have a choir, but here are some of the perks of allowing the Holy Spirit to be reflected outward in song. A couple of thoughts. If you wear a robe, which most choirs have, if you wear a robe, you don't have to worry about clean clothes for Sunday. <laughs> Another perk of being in the choir. Have you ever noticed they never pass, pass the offering plate? In the choir? <laughs> Have you ever been sitting up front and wondering who was sitting beside you but were afraid to turn and ask? That's a perk of being in the choir. <laughs> Worry about nodding off that the pastor may see you sleeping during his sermon? Not in the choir. And finally, one of the best perks is that the choir is always given the most comfortable seats in the house. It's not about whether we have a choir or not. It's about the encouragement and the joy of being Holy Spirit, Christ-centered. And those are just perks of our world we can share with their world. So here's my suggestion, since we don't have a choir, Take your favorite song and burn it onto a CD. Put the CD in your car CD player as you're driving along. Sing boldly so that you can look to the left and the right and see the faces of people who are receiving great joy from your message of song. That is joy. Joy for them to see you joy for you to see them. In all things, be grateful to God for the blessings that you've been given. Think often of them, especially in times when you're struggling. Because that is the time when the Holy Spirit will give you the strength and the joy to be grateful. So I have one last little story to share with you. It comes out of a book that Charles Swindoll wrote. An experience of of great magnitude. There was a, a dad who was in the VA hospital. And as you know, the VA hospital in many cases does not allow small children to visit the room. 
the dad had a severe disease and he had been in for quite a while. So he decided that what he would do is carve a small wooden truck for his son since he could not be with him, since he could not see his son and because he missed him so much. And when he finished, it was on a day of visitation where his family was coming, but his son could not join him. So he asked the, the orderly to take the small truck down because his son would be on the lawn in front of the building and he would be able to see him from the fifth story window. And so the attendant took the truck and met the family and presented the, the gift to the small boy. And the boy looks at the, at the truck that had been hand carved just for him and he was so excited with it, he held it to his chest with all joy and he ran and gave the, the uh, attendant a bit, very big hug. And all the time, five stories up at that window, up in the top, the father was going, I made that for you, my son. It is my gift to you. And yet the son was hugging the orderly who handed him the truck. And he kept banging on the window. I made that truck for you. I am your father. And the orderly stopped and knelt down beside the child. And he said, the gift is from your father. He carved that gift for you. Look up and see. And so the child raised his eyes to the fifth story window and saw his dad waving. I made that gift for you. The son turns his thoughts from the people around and says, I love my truck, Dad. I love you. Come home soon. I miss you. Aren't we kind of like the child? We very seldom look up to thank God for the things, the gifts that God has prepared for us. Spend our lives being cautious, says the Apostle Paul. Not as unwise, but wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Because I'm here to tell you that there is a dark side to every positive opportunity. Don't be lured into life's distractions and addictions, which will most certainly lead you away from Christ and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Instead, speak and sing to each other, and the Holy Spirit will encourage you and drive you and direct you and counsel you to give thanks to God for all things. And the children say, Amen.